Hello, my name is David Richards. I'm the director of the Margaret Chase Smith Library in Skowhegan. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is Margaret Chase Smith's connections to the University of Maine and why there is both a Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center on the Orono campus and then there's also the affiliation with the library here in Skowhegan. So I'm going to share the screen and put on PowerPoint presentation to walk you through those connections. And as I say, what I will be doing is uh, discussing how Margaret Chase Smith came to head of this association with the University of Maine. And what you should be thinking about as I go along is the fact that Senator Smith's education ended in high school. She was a graduate of Skagen High School, class of 1916. She did not have the opportunity to go on to college. I want to call attention to the photo for a couple of reasons. One, this is her senior class posed in front of the White House down in Washington, D.C. The custom back at that time was that Skagen High School seniors got to take a field trip down to Washington, D.C. Did, little did she know at the time that a quarter of a century later, uh, she'll be down in Washington serving in government. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But there's a couple other factors I want to note about the photograph. One is that the next year, 1917, a lot of her male classmates found themselves over in Europe fighting in World War I. And it was quite a heavy toll that Skowhegan took during the war, and that's something that always stood out to Margaret Chase Smith and something that she remembered as she went through her political career. The other factor is the young women you see in this picture. This is a time when women in this country don't have the right to vote. And a short time after this photo is taken, women are going to start protesting out in front of the White House and chaining themselves to the fence that surrounds the White House, trying to protest for the right to vote. The suffragettes, uh, they were successful finally in 1920 when the 19th Amendment was ratified in the Constitution. So as I talk about Margaret Chase Smith's political career, keep bear in mind the fact that she grew up at a time when women initially didn't have the right to vote. So moving on to her political career, she actually first went down to Congress in 1936 because that's when her husband Clyde got elected to Congress and she served as his personal secretary. And she was very familiar with the issues of the day. And that becomes important because Clyde passes away in 1940. And one of the customs in this country is that quite often uh, it's been a male who's passed away. So the wife has been appointed to fill out the rest of the term. Um, then Margaret won election on her own. Uh, so she served altogether four terms in the United States House of Representatives, serving there from 1940 to 1949. And then she decided to take on a new challenge, and that challenge was to run for the United States Senate. It was a decision that surprised people because there were already some very strong candidates in the race. And you see the men uh, in the back of this picture. Uh, the tallest man is Horace Hildreth. And next to him is Sumner Sewell. And one of them was the sitting governor of the state of Maine and one was a former governor of the state of Maine. And everyone assumed one of those two men would win the Republican primary that year. There's actually a third male candidate and he's on the other side of Margaret Chase Smith, who you see at the far right of the picture. And that's a minister by the name of the Reverend Albion Beveridge. But in this four-way race, it was actually Margaret Chase Smith who won the vote not just one, uh, she won a majority of the vote, which is extremely hard to do in a four-way race. It's one of the reasons that here in Maine, we've gone to rank choice voting uh, to try to make sure that the winning candidate actually has a majority of the vote. And I'll talk more in a moment about my theory of how it was that in a four-way race with three men, that Margaret T. Smith was actually able to win a majority of the vote. What that means is that she gets to go down to Washington, D.C. in January of 1949 to be sworn into office. And I want to show you the plaque that she received. This is something that all new members of the Senate were given. And if you look on the plaque about halfway down on the left-hand side and start reading from the word who, you'll find the following statement. Who being duly elected by the people of his state was first sworn to office this third day of January 1949. 
And you probably heard or you can see that there is a grammatical mistake, that even though this plaque was given to Margaret Chase Smith, they didn't bother to get one made up that said her state. They just gave her the one for what they assumed would be winning, which was a male candidate. So it says his state. And it gives you a sense of the obstacles that Margaret Chase Smith uh, faced during her career. Even after you get away from this legal barrier that women aren't allowed to vote, aren't allowed to run for offices like the United States Senate, um, there's still the cultural barrier. And that barrier is that um, being taken seriously as a woman, trying to do the types of things that she was done. So they didn't even bother uh, to get up a, a plaque made for her that said her state rather than his state. The most famous thing that she did in the United States Senate actually happened very early in her career. And she's elected at a time when there's still a lot of tumult in the world. Uh, world War II is over, um, but we find ourselves in a rivalry with the Soviet Union. And two things of significance happened on the world stage in 1949. One is that the Soviet Union explodes an atomic bomb. The United States had ended World War II by dropping the two atomic bombs on Japan. We had a nuclear monopoly, and that's how we felt we'd be able to keep world peace so there wouldn't be a third world war. And all of a sudden, here is the Soviet Union um, being able to explode an atomic bomb, which surprised us from the standpoint that we had looked at them as being a backward technological country, but here they are with this technology. Uh, and the second thing that happens is a very large nation to the south of the Soviet Union, large in terms of landmass and population, China falls to the communists. Mao Zedong and the communists beat Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists, uh, drive them off uh, to the island of Taiwan. And the speculation becomes those two things happened because there are communists and communist sympathizers in the United States. Uh, in particular, the concern is that they're in the State Department. And the politician who really latches onto that issue is the man you see to the right of Margaret Chase Smith in the photo, a senator from Wisconsin by the name of Joseph McCarthy. You know, he's only entered the Senate two years prior to Margaret Chase Smith, so he doesn't have a lot of experience there, but he seizes upon this issue. And beginning in February of 1950, begins going around the country, uh, making accusations uh, that there are communists and communist sympathizers in our government and in society at large that are undermining our way of life. Uh, this causes um, great concern. Margaret Chase Smith is concerned by these accusations that he's making, but when she goes to look at the evidence that Joe McCarthy had, it's nothing that would ever stand up under close scrutiny. Um, he was very famous for using the tactic of calling people before committees, making accusations, and then when people invoke their Fifth Amendment privilege of the right to remain silent, using that as the basis to say that people were guilty because if they didn't have anything to hide, they would just answer his questions. And Margaret Chase Smith very quickly figured out what Joe McCarthy was up to, that he was a, a classic demagogue building his own career at the expense of other people, and didn't like the tactics that they, he was using, which were clear violations of people's constitutional rights of the Fifth Amendment privilege of the right to remain silent, and violating people's due process rights as well. And she felt something needed to be said. So she got up on the floor of the Senate on June 1st, 1950, and made a very famous speech called the Declaration of Conscience. She never mentions Joe McCarthy by name, but by criticizing the tactics that he's using, it's very clear who she's speaking out against. It causes a great sensation. Uh, the next day, all across the country, newspapers and banner headlines are talking about the speech. 11 days later, she's on the cover of Newsweek magazine, which you see on the left-hand side. And the caption down below says, Senator Smith, a woman vice president, question mark. So this is the event that puts her on the national stage. She's no longer just a freshman female senator from a very tiny state. She is now a national figure, such that people are starting to speculate, might she be a vice presidential candidate someday, or even a presidential candidate? The next election cycle, presidential election cycle, was in 1952. The Republican nominee is General Dwight Eisenhower. And you can see this political cartoon on the right uh, pairs Margaret Chase Smith, a vice president with the presidential nominee, General Eisenhower, had the, actually the 
cartoon had the slogan, Peg and Ike, a pair you'll like. Obviously, General Eisenhower did not choose Margaret Chase Smith. He chose Richard Nixon as his running mate. I always like to think how U.S. history might have been different if in 1952, General Eisenhower had selected Margaret Chase Smith rather than Richard Nixon. Senator Smith did go on to have her own presidential campaign in 1964. Uh, the layout that year was that there was a sitting Democratic president, uh, Lyndon Johnson. As Margaret Chase Smith thought about running for president, she, in, in 1960, she assumed she'd be running against uh, John Kennedy. Um, but because of his assassination, it wound up being Lyndon Johnson. But as she looked at the Republican field, uh, she didn't like the choices that Republican voters were going to be presented with. You had a candidate on the right, Barry Goldwater, a senator from Arizona, and the other leading candidate was the governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller, who was considered a liberal Republican. And she need, thought there needed to be a moderate voice, so that's why she decided to join the race. Uh, she took her candidacy across the country. Uh, she didn't spend a lot of time campaigning because she didn't believe she should miss her work in the Senate. Uh, she took her candidacy all the way to the Republican convention that year, which was in San Francisco, and she wound up on the final ballot coming in second, which was very important to her uh, to be able to lay down that marker to women who came after her, that there were still a couple more places to go to get the nomination and eventually to get elected president of the United States. But she was the first woman to have her name placed in nomination by one of the two major parties, in this case, the Republican Party, in 1964. So it was definitely breaking a new barrier for women. So I mentioned to you that when she was running for the um, Senate in 1948, that in a four-way race, she was able to beat three men uh, and not just beat them, to get a majority of the vote. And I have a theory on how that was. And it plays into the fact that she is a woman. And that one of the ways that she came up through politics was not through electoral politics, it was through the politics of women's groups. Um, she had helped to establish a chapter of the Business and Professional Women's Club in Skowhegan. Uh, she was a statewide newsletter editor for the BPW, and then she became the state president of the BPW. And all that time, she's meeting a lot of women, she's um, developing relationships with these women, and I think it served her well when she ran for office in 1948. My theory is that she overwhelmingly won the women's vote, and she got enough male voters to give her a majority of the vote in the primary in 1948. And so then here's an example. In 1948, she's going to speak to the University Wives Club in Orono. Uh, she had this very strong base of women's groups of all different kinds. And uh, that's my theory on how she was able to win that election in 1948. Uh, so as I mentioned, she's getting to be on the national stage. She's a United States Senator now. And the University of Maine starts cultivating her favor. And one of the ways is by giving her an honorary degree. It's one of the first universities in the United States to give her one. Um, after she makes the Declaration of Conscience, she gets a whole spate of honorary degrees. But uh, the University of Maine was in the forefront. It's somewhere between the third and the sixth uh, university to give her an honorary degree in 1949. A couple had given her degrees in 1948. And it pays dividends. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith uh, starts doing things that will help out the University of Maine. Uh, in 1958, she helps to start a University of Maine congressional internship program. And in 1964, she uh, initiates a NASA summer intern program for University of Maine students. And I want to use this as an opportunity to let you know that Margaret Chase Smith is a very strong supporter of the space program. Uh, when Sputnik went up in 1957, uh, the Soviet Union sends the first satellite in space. Um, Margaret J. Smith and her fellow senators are very concerned about what the Soviet Union is able to do, that they had beaten us into space, putting up the first satellite. And what the Senate does is create the Aeronautical and Space Sciences Committee. And Margaret is one of the charter members of that 
Committee, and it oversees the creation of NASA, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration. It's going to run our space program, the first program being Project Mercury with seven astronauts who do very simple missions, going up into space, coming right back down, Alan Shepard, going up and orbiting the Earth four times, John Glenn, and eventually more intricate missions like Project Gemini, which were two manned missions, and eventually the Apollo missions, the three manned missions, which are going to take us to the moon. She was even on the Aeronautical and Space Science Committee at a time when the Space Shuttle program first came before Congress, which was back in 1965. And the photo that I've used here is actually of Telstar, uh, which was an American satellite program. It was the first um, commercial satellite that provided the capability uh, to broadcast between the United States and Europe. And Margaret Chase Smith was very proud of the fact that the receiving station was here in Maine and Andover, Maine. Uh, the president who gave us the challenge that we were going to get to the moon before the Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union kept beating us, his first satellite, first man in space, uh, John Kennedy, uh, says that by the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him home safely. And this is actually a photo of Mar um, President Kennedy coming to Orono, to the University of Maine, to receive an honorary degree. And that was in October of 1963. You see President Kennedy behind the podium. And on the podium at the far right, you see Margaret Chase Smith. Um, a lot of dignitaries up there, but Margaret is also, Senator Smith is also one who gets invited to that ceremony as well. And interestingly, that's um, actually the last public appearance that John Kennedy had scheduled before he goes to Dallas, Texas, in November of 1963, where he's assassinated. So the culmination of Margaret Chase Smith's political career uh, comes in 1972. By that time, the United States is very deeply into the Vietnam War, which has become very unpopular, particularly in the 1970s. Um, we have had lots of protests. Uh, there's a student protest uh, at Kent State University in Ohio in 1970, and uh, some college students are killed by the Ohio National Guard, which triggers a whole series of student protests across the country. And Margaret Chase Smith, as she comes up for election in 1972, is identified as someone who's very much supporting the war as it's being prosecuted by President Nixon and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. But she doesn't shy away from going to college campuses as she's running for re-election. And she very famously goes down to Colby College, and that's the newspaper photo you see here. And she addresses the students and she feels their questions. And one of the concerns in 1972 is Margaret is in her mid 70s. And she not only seems to some people out of touch with what's going on in Vietnam, but just not up to the task at her age of being a United States Senator. And as she starts to feel questions, she doesn't appear to the students to be responding well. And it's um, one of those moments in the election uh, that doesn't serve her well. Uh, the, the big issue was that um, she was denying that the war had been expanded into Laos and Cambodia, which was the, the Nixon line, that was still confined to Vietnam. And one of the students had just returned from fighting uh, in the expanded area. And uh, so she, again, she seemed to be out of touch. And that, she lost the election to uh, William Hathaway, the only election she ever lost. So at that point, she needs to decide what to do with the rest of her life. And what she decides she's going to do is start a library. And here you see an aerial photo on the left of the library, and it, even an interior view of the museum at the library. Uh, it, the plans begin shortly after 1973, when she is out of office. Uh, it takes a while to get things organized, and the library act, actually opens in 1982. And what she decides to do is to build it as an addition onto her house. One of her stipulations is this library has to be in Skowhegan 
at her home. And the other stipulation is that there has to be fundraising, not only to build the library, but to endow the library so that it'll be able to continue to operate. One of the things I want to highlight is by having it at her house, um, when the library first opens in 1982, she is still here. She is a presence. When people come to see the library to tour the museum, um, they're also going to be an opportunity to speak with the person that this library and museum is about, Margaret Chase Smith. She didn't pass away till 1995, so for the first dozen years of the library's history, she's right here to help tell her story. Now those stipulations that I talk about of having to be in Skowhegan and having to raise money for an endowment scared away most of the main institutions. She didn't want her papers carted off to Orono or to Brunswick or to Lewiston, and she didn't have any natural affiliations with those schools. She hadn't gone to any of those schools although some had already started to court her. The institution that agreed to abide by those two terms was actually a school out in Michigan called Northwood Institute. It was actually a fairly new school. It had started um, again after Sputnik uh, in 1959. And uh, being a new school, it didn't have a lot of legacy alumni and alumna. And so it very strategically went around the country and started courting people who didn't have these academic affiliations, uh, these alma maters. And one of the people they stuck, uh, struck a friendship up with was Margaret Chase Smith. She became very close to the founders of Northwood Institute, uh, Arthur Turner and Gary Stauffer. And they agreed to abide by her terms. So when the library opens in 1982, you see Above Margaret Chase Smith Library, it says Northwood Institute. Nevertheless, there was still a strong University of Maine connection in that the very first director of the Margaret Chase Smith Library was James McCampbell, who you see in the photo here, who had been the director of the Fogler Library at the University of Maine. And he's the one who set up the collection as it comes back from Washington, D.C., after Margaret has left office and uh, starts to set up the library here in Skowhegan at Margaret Chase Smith's home. Uh, he was succeeded by Dr. Gregory Gallat, who got his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and his PhD from the University of Maine. And he was the director of the Margaret Chase Smith Library for almost 25 years, from 1987 to 2011. And along the way, the university continued to do outreach to Margaret Chase Smith. In 1988, they organized the Politics of Conscience, a tribute to Senator Margaret Chase Smith, which was a springboard to some other activities that I will mention about. Uh, this was used as an opportunity to make Margaret Chase Smith an honorary inductee into all Maine women organization at the University of Maine. And it was also used as the opportunity to create a Margaret Chase Smith lectureship on public affairs. In the photo on the left, you see the very first speaker as the woman standing next to Margaret Chase Smith, Donna Shalala, um, who has over time been the president of the University of Wisconsin and the University of Miami. But in this case, she had been invited because she was uh, the head of the Department of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. So she was the secretary of that department. She was the first Margaret Chase Smith lecturer. And the most recent in 2019 was Admiral Nora Tyson, who you see on the right. Uh, and she was the first woman to command a US Naval fleet, you know, the sixth fleet in the Pacific. A few years later, um, it was announced, this was something that was already in, in the works, that the public policy programs at the University of Maine would be brought together in one place under a policy center named after Margaret Chase Smith. And here you see when that announcement was made, um, the first director of the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center is on the left, Steve Ballard, and between them is the president at that time of the University of Maine, Dale Lick. So the Policy Center has many activities. One that it has done from the outset is to publish um, different public policy statements and papers in a 
publication called the Maine Policy Review. And you can see at several points, Margaret Chase Smith has been on the cover. Public policy was obviously something Margaret Chase Smith was very interested in, having served in Congress for over 30 years. Something else Margaret Chase Smith was very interested in, and one of the reasons she wanted to have the library at her house was she very much was interested in young people. And she had very two very clear messages for young people, and that was to have aspirations and to think about how they could serve other people. And she never had any children of her own, but she was always very engaged with young people. And one of the ways that we have tried to preserve that legacy is by offering some scholarships to help young people with their educations. And one of those is the Margaret Affairs, Margaret Chase Smith Public Affairs Scholarship, which was initiated in 1998. And depicted here are the two current recipients of that scholarship. On the left is Cole Butler, who is a mathematician. And he's interested in epidemiology which is a whole new cast now as we are living through a pandemic. But his project that he has gotten support for is he was interested in the opioid epidemic. So he's trying to use some mathematical modeling to understand um, how that has developed. And then on the right, uh, in the middle of the picture is Abby Depre, who is a senior at the University of Maine currently and she's a political science major and what she's interested in is the voting habits of particularly students and in particular college students um, as it relates to elections and in particular with the upcoming uh, presidential election she's interested in the voting habits of young people and ways that we can make voting easier for young people so they are both currently at work on their projects and uh, we'll do presentations uh, on those projects when they are done. The other scholarship that's been set up more recently is a research scholarship. And here you see one of the recipients, Harley Rogers, who is now a graduate of the University of Maine. And her honors college thesis was on Margaret Chase Smith. So she received report, uh, support to be able to come to the library and do her research. And here you see her poster presentation female political campaigns, just the right amount of femininity. And what she was interested in looking at uh, was how um, Margaret Chase Smith had to present herself uh, being a woman uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, how she had to come off as feminine and domestic. Uh, it couldn't just all be about public policy if you were a woman at this time. These relationships that uh, existed when Northwood University administered the Margaret Chase Smith Library were made more formal in 2012. At that time, uh, beginning in 2011, uh, Northwood University decided it really didn't make sense for a school in Michigan to have this outpost in Maine. And they decided they no longer wanted to administer the library. Um, at that point, it reverted back to a foundation, which is in Portland, Maine, the Margaret Chase Smith Foundation, which provides the support for the Margaret Chase Smith Library. The foundation did not want to be running the library, so they approached the University of Maine and asked if they would administer the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And so this is the formal recognition of that new relationship in April of 2012. And on the left, you have the president of the University of Maine at the time, Paul Ferguson. And on the right are the two representatives of the Margaret Chase Smith Foundation. In the middle is uh, Merton Henry. And on the far right is Charlie Craig. And Charlie is the current president of the Margaret Chase Smith Foundation. And so that has been the nature of the relationship since two, January 1st, 2012. The library and the collections and the grounds are owned by the Margaret Chase Smith Foundation in Portland, uh, but we are administered by the University of Maine. So I am an employee of the University of Maine. And that's given us some opportunities to become even more connected to the University of Maine. For example, the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center runs a program called Maine New Leadership, which is a program 
for young women either going to school in Maine or from Maine. Um, generally speaking, it's women going to school in Maine. And it's a week-long program where they receive leadership training and they spend at least half a day with each session, uh, each program, coming to the Margaret Chase Smith Library to learn about Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, they usually, the day starts out down in Augusta at the Maine State Legislature, and in the afternoon, they come to the library. And the driving force behind new leadership is the woman on the right, Mary Cathcart, who recently retired, and so we honored her with a, a cake congratulating her on her retirement and all the great work that she had done doing this leadership training for young women since 2008. And there continue to be other opportunities um, that involve both faculty and students. Uh, for example, in the past year or two, a group of faculty got together from different disciplines, brought in some students, for example, like Carly Rogers, to um, look at the recipes that Margaret Chase Smith would use and hand out when she was a candidate. For example, when she was running for president in 1964, because she was a woman, people would ask for recipes and she had a blueberry muffin recipe that she would hand out to people. But again, it ties into what Harley Rogers had noted in her honors thesis, that being a female politician, she couldn't just be about policy. She had to have this domestic feminine side as well. Um, so this group has been doing research uh, into Margaret Chase Smith's recipes to understand her more as a person, more as a politician, and to just look, examine what the role of women during the 1950s and 60s is, how they have to walk this very fine line of trying to have more a role in American society, um, but still adhere to these very traditional roles that women are expected to be in. And we hope here at the Margaret Chase Smith Library that we will continue to have more opportunities uh, to have an impact on students and faculty as they do their research. Uh, we actually have someone coming from the University of Maine on Monday to do research here. And over the years, we look forward to having continued opportunities to be a source of research for both students and faculty at the University of Maine. And I thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint presentation and hope that you'll have opportunities to see other videos that the library will be presenting during Maine Impact Week. Thank you very much.